Good day. For those of you who do not know me, my name is Douglas Harder, and in this topic we're going to discuss dealing with jitter. So in this topic we're going to describe the concept of jitter. Specifically, we will consider what happens if the readings or samples that we have are not being read periodically. For example, they may be the readings may be close to being taken some time h apart, but there's some potential error. So what we're going to do is try to, as reasonably as possible, adjust the red value to compensate for the error in the time of the reading. So we're not going to eliminate the noise, but rather, for after all, we have formulas that will mitigate the effects of the noise, but instead we will simply try to compensate for the fact that a reading may have taken 0.3 seconds early or 0.5 seconds later than expected. Now, within engineering, the term jitter is often used to describe small anomalies that occur regularly within a system. One example of jitter is, so we're reading a sensor and we know that the sensor's result is going to be noisy. However, also the reading may not be taken exactly every h units of time, say every h seconds. Consequently, our most recent reading therefore may not have actually been at the periodic time t sub k, but rather at the time t sub k plus delta times h. Now we're going to assume that delta is small, say no more than 0 0.5. So every reading occurs close to, but not necessarily at the interval that we expect. Now, if we actually know whether or not a reading was taken early or late, we should try to compensate for it. So, the question is, how do we correct to find a reasonable value for y sub k if the reading y was not taken at the time we expected it to be read? After all, if the system is going up, then, or if y is increasing, had the reading of y occurred a split second later, on average, it would be slightly larger. The reason is because all of the formulas we've been looking at so far require that the samples be taken periodically. And we would rather not have to go back and calculate new formulas for every different set of t values. So what we're going to do is we're going to estimate the value of the signal at time t sub k using a least squares best fitting polynomial. So we are now at this point here and we will now choose y sub k so that that approximation remains the same if we discard y and now use the value y sub k. So suppose we are trying to read the most recent reading y sub k, but we have a reading y and it was taken at time tk plus delta times h. What we will do is we will find the constant coefficient of the least squares best fitting polynomial that passes through these points where all the other points are equally spaced, but the last point is at time delta with the value y. Then we will find the constant coefficient of the least squares best fitting polynomial that passes through these points where that last point is now zero and y sub k. Remember, the constant coefficient is the least squares best fitting polynomial passing through those points evaluated at zero, 
and that is our best approximation of the data at time t sub k. We're then going to equate these two coefficients and solve for the value y sub k. Now solving or finding these values is actually going to require a significant amount of work. Specifically, it's going to require algebra and a lot of it. So a symbolic computation language such as Maple is excellent for this. Now, suppose that we are finding interpolating or best least squares best fitting polynomials that pass through the last five points. So n is equal to four. In this case, here are the two constant coefficients equated and we can solve for y sub k. And you'll notice that this is a reasonably straightforward, simple formula. It is simply two linear combinations of the previous y values and the most current reading. So this is actually very fast to calculate. Not only that, in Maple, you can also do a series expansion around delta. So you can find a first order approximation, which means you can use this if delta is sufficiently small, in which case you get this even easier formula. So for example, if delta is guaranteed to be less than 0.1, then delta squared is less than 0.01. You could also do this for least squares, best fitting quadratic polynomials, and using Maple you could get a second order series solution around delta. So here it is. Again, all those coefficients would be calculated at compilation time, so this is actually going to be reasonably efficient. And if delta is small, once again, you can, of course, simply use the first order approximation. So get rid of the second term. So that would be even more efficient and still reasonable if delta is less than 0.1 in absolute value. Just to show you how easy this is, here's the maple code. And you remember that Maple is, like Python, an interpreted language. So restart clears all of memory. Any assigned local variables are now unassigned. We're then going to set n is equal to 4. I could actually set n to be any positive integer value I wish, but so that you can recreate what you see above, that's sufficient. Next, t's are going to be a sequence of integers from negative n up to negative 1. We'll represent the y values at these points by y4, y3, y2, y1. Now, the pound symbol in maple is a comment symbol, as you may have guessed from the previous line. Uh, and so we could either have a curve that is a linear curve or a quadratic curve. Here we're going to use the quadratic curve for finding the least squares best fitting quadratic polynomial that passes through these five points. So here we see the polynomial that passes through the points when the last point is zero and the unknown value y zero. We're going to evaluate this at the point t equals zero, and that is going to be our approximation of y at the time t sub k, the most recent t value. We're going to then assume that delta is real, and we'll do a least squares best fitting polynomial, but now the last point is the estimation at time delta when the reading was actually taken and the actual reading y. 
Once again, we will evaluate this at time t equals zero. And for simplicity, uh, you can tell Maple to simplify algebraic expressions. And in this case, it's simplifying with respect to size. What is the most compact? Then once again, I will simply equate these two and solve for y naught, simplify that expression, and assign it to y naught. I can then, if I wish, do a series solution around delta equals zero. And this is useful if you want a, for example, a first or second order approximation, which would be easier to calculate. Following this topic, you now understand the idea of jitter. So for example, you understand that a system that is theoretically sampling data periodically may not be able to do so exactly, and there may be errors in the readings. You know that we can attempt to compensate for such errors in sampling time. And you know that the reason for this is because all of the formulas we have used up until now require periodic sampling. So you know that it's possible to set a rule and then find appropriate values of y sub k that satisfy that rule. For example, what we did was given the data that with the last point not being read periodically, we then found the best approximation of the polynomial that most closely approximates that, and we evaluate that at time t sub k, that is zero. We then found that value of y sub k, which would give that same solution if we assumed y sub k was red at the appropriate time. So one simple rule allows us to get a reasonable value of what y would most likely have been had the reading been taken not at time tk plus delta h, but rather at time tk. Here are the references, acknowledgements, the colophon, and a disclaimer. Cheers!